It's absolutely fascinating to me that people can so completely misunderstand who I was and the role I played in the life of Jesus. As if the prior confusion was not enough, recent popular books and movies have added a layer of misinformation to the mix. Oh, I'll be the first to admit, I was attracted to Jesus. We all were. He was truly the most remarkable man I'd ever met. He was forthright, honest, strong, and the most compassionate person we'd ever known. Yes, we all loved him, but not in the way that I've often been portrayed. I'd like to try to correct some of the misinformation about me, and hopefully in the process, help you to better understand the only one who is really important in my story, Jesus. First of all, this confusion about my identity is not something new. It's gone on for centuries. Names in our world were different from yours. Our names reflected either our parents or our place of birth. For example, the name Simon bar Jonas identified Simon as the son of Jonas. My name, Mary Magdalene, identified me as Mary from the region known as Magdala. Magdala was a small village between Tiberias and Capernaum on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Because my name is Mary, and because several other Marys appear in the New Testament, it's easy to understand the confusion, especially when not a lot is written about each Mary. Besides that, other stories about women never identify them by name, and so it's easy to get their stories mixed up with mine. Perhaps the person I am most often confused with is Mary of Bethany. You may recall that Mary of Bethany was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Together they often hosted Jesus in their home. It was a favorite getaway for him. Whenever Jesus needed some time to rest and to be re-energized, he would go there. I suppose you could say they were the closest thing to a real family outside of Jesus' mother and brothers that he had. I'm also sometimes confused with the woman who came to the house of one of the Pharisees, a woman who was said to have lived a sinful life. This woman, as you may remember, anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume in her tears and then wiped them with her hair. The Pharisees criticized her for her behavior and Jesus for allowing her to do it. Surely, they said, if he were a prophet, he would have known what kind of woman this is. Then there was the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. The men who found her were ready to stone her to death. Jesus told the men that whoever among them was without sin could cast the first stone. They all went away. Like me, this woman owes her life today to Jesus. Well, I was none of those women. My story is quite different. As a child, and for as long as I can remember, I was tormented by demons. I know that probably sounds strange to you. Much of the time, I could live a fairly normal life. Then, without warning, I would turn into a monster. Even though I had no actual recollection of these episodes, people would tell me that I would scream, curse, rant, and rave. They said it was as though I had the strength of a man, and it would take five or six people to restrain me. My parents were exhausted. As hard as it was for them, I was still living with them as a young woman. They had tried every cure, potion, and medicine available, but nothing helped. I'll never forget the way my parents looked at me. Yes, it was with love, but along with it was a look of fear, even terror. I remember my parents talking about a prophet in the region, but then others had prayed and nothing had happened. Still, they said, it was worth a chance. I'll never forget the day he came to the house. He came with some other men. They were rough looking, like the fishermen of the village. But he was different. They said he had been a carpenter. His skin was bronzed by the sun. His hands were calloused from working with the wood. But he had a tenderness about him that I can't explain. 
Most of all, it was his eyes, piercing, yet full of love. It was as if he could look right through me. Before I could say one word, I felt my body tense, and the horror began again. I heard myself say in a voice that wasn't my own, Go away. Leave me alone. He was not repulsed, the way so many others were, and he spoke in a commanding voice. Come out of her. Come out of her and never return. My body shook uncontrollably, and I collapsed on the floor, completely limp, but for the first time in my life, completely whole. Don't ask me how I knew, but I knew in that moment that the nightmare was over. Others were skeptical, but I knew it was over. Or perhaps I should say, my life had just begun. Sometime after that miracle, I joined a group of women disciples who followed Jesus and shared his ministry. Many of the others had stories much like mine. We helped in any way we could, even providing for him out of our own resources. It was the least we could do for someone who had done so much for us, setting us free from the powers of evil to know the love of God. What a privilege to travel from place to place with Jesus, hearing his marvelous teaching, witnessing countless healings, and telling our own stories to point others to him. Yes, he was a remarkable man. We were all drawn to him, partly because of his love for others, but also because of his love for his father. I can't begin to tell you what it was like to follow him to a hill outside Jerusalem called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Yes, the place was deserving of its name. They arrested Jesus, set up a mock trial, and condemned him to death. How anyone could treat Jesus the way they did was far beyond my wildest nightmares. When I saw his bloodied and weak body trying to carry that cross, it was as if life left my own body. I felt hollow, empty, helpless. I wanted to scream at the injustice, yet few seemed to notice. It was as if the evil that had inhabited my body years ago had now taken control of the world, and his pain was the result. We women stayed at the cross, most of the disciples fled for fear of their own lives. Only John was left. I suppose no one thought a group of women were a threat. Some of the men made fun of us. Take a good look, they said, and see what happens to blasphemers and impostors. When they saw we would not be intimidated, they tired of their taunts and left us alone. Some of the soldiers, however, didn't give up so easily. One was particularly obnoxious. He tried to grab me. It was then that a centurion who had been watching it all came over, grabbed him, and threw him to the ground. Get back to your post. Leave these women alone, or you'll all spend the night in chains, he said. Then the centurion looked at me and said, I'm sorry. I don't know why he acted the way he did, but I was certain we would have no more trouble from the soldiers. When it was all over, a few of us stayed to bury Jesus. At the end, it was just me, another woman, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus. We took the lifeless body of the one who had given us life down from the cross. We wiped the blood and grime of that horrible day from his body as best we could and carried him to Joseph's tomb where the soldiers rolled a huge stone over the entrance. We walked without saying a word, each trying to fight off the hopeless feeling inside, each wondering how life could ever go on, each wishing in some way that we had been killed, not him. Little could we imagine what would happen in the next days. We had all heard Jesus talk of dying and rising again, but none of us, were able to comprehend or even imagine what he really meant. I went to the tomb that Sunday morning after the Passover 
to do one final act of kindness for Jesus. I would do what we were not allowed to do that Friday night, anoint his body for burial. I know it wasn't much, but it was the least I could do for someone who had done so much for me. I brought perfumes and spices, wondering all the way who would roll away the stone. Would the soldiers be willing to help? I could only hope they would. The sun was just beginning to come up, and I could see in the vanishing shadows that the stone had already been rolled away. The entrance was open, and the soldiers were all gone. I dropped the spices, ran back to where the disciples were hiding, and told them I feared that someone had stolen the body. Peter and John ran to the tomb. I could not keep up with them. But when I got back, I saw a man standing alone. He must have seen me crying and said, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? I pleaded with him to tell me where they had taken the body of Jesus. I prayed he would know. I couldn't see his face as he was looking away from me. Without turning, he uttered one word, Mary. It was as if two years had not happened, and I was taken back to my home where I first heard Jesus say my name. I now saw his face, and I fell at his feet and cried, Teacher! Tears of joy rushed down my cheeks. Waves of hope pulsed through my body. Life once again entered my spirit. Teacher, teacher, teacher. I said the word over and over again. I wanted to jump up and tell the others, but I couldn't leave him. He smiled and said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. It was then I saw the spices I had dropped before. I'd almost forgotten why I had come, but it didn't matter now. I had seen the Lord. Nothing else mattered. He was alive. Jesus was alive. Nothing else mattered that day. And nothing else matters tonight. Only one thing. He is alive. He is alive. May you fall at his feet and know he died and rose for you. May you too be able to say, I have seen the Lord. 